crime is changing. Everything appears to be moving out of the cities into the rural areas. And the two biggest manhunts in American history have not taken place in Chicago or New York or Los Angeles. They've taken place out in the forests of North Carolina, the hunt for Eric Rudolph, and the hunt for the three four corner paramilitaries in Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, these are the environments that uh, crime is moving into. And we have become convinced in training officers all over the country in tactical tracking that there is not a lot of knowledge in camouflage and concealment. And it's the aspects of camouflage and concealment which could save the life of an officer. So there is an application to city officers as well as rural officers too. It doesn't matter whether you're a hunter, a wildlife specialist, or a law enforcement officer, or military. Camouflage and concealment will enhance your ability to do your job effectively, remain safe, and hopefully have a much better rate of success. This is a project to instruct you in the proper use of camouflage and concealment. It is designed to teach you to use the principles properly. Camouflage and concealment is not an issue of aggression, nor does it make any political statement. It is simply about life and death, matters of survival and success. Without them, your mission and objective will fail. The following is a quote directly from the United States Army Manual on Camouflage. Camouflage is one of the basic weapons of war. Correctly used, it can spell the difference between a successful campaign and defeat. To the individual, it can mean the difference between life and death. The individual soldier is responsible for his own concealment. His responsibility here is just as great as his responsibility for his rifle, and he must know as much about camouflage as he does about his weapon. Just as training in marksmanship teaches a soldier to hit a target accurately, so does knowledge of camouflage teach him how to escape becoming a target himself. Regardless of the type of warfare, camouflage remains important. Small, semi-independent units must furnish their own security, reconnaissance, and surveillance. They must be able to exist for long periods of time with a minimum of control and support from higher headquarters. As a result, their success will depend to a large extent upon their ability to remain concealed from the enemy. This, in turn, will depend upon the knowledge and proper execution of the principles of camouflage. The military has taught for years the principles of camouflage and concealment, yet many soldiers do not practice them. Many have died on the battlefield as a result. The principles of camouflage and concealment apply to far more than the application of face paint and BDUs. We must learn to do battle smarter than the enemy and the bad guys. As you listen to the wisdom shared by David Scott Donnellan, Keep in mind that he has used and learned these principles and techniques through more than 30 years of international military experience. Much of that time was spent in a combat environment and in combat theaters on the African continent. The OSI network is built upon veteran personnel from both police and military special operations. The information shared here can save your life. Please take the matter seriously and apply these principles to your team and personal operations. The techniques are battle-tested and have prepared the way for successful operations for thousands of years. There are two types of camouflage, static and moving. 
Static camouflage is the primary use in static roles such as surveillance or sniping operations. Moving camouflage is designed for the individual or team to be mobile and fluid. Moving camouflage techniques are useful on operations such as tracking, patrolling, reconnaissance, and moving into a surveillance site. If camouflage is to be used, you and your unit should consider the use of a 100% camouflage policy. In other words, do not neglect any part of your person, gear, or personal kit. Weapons, packs, and other equipment and related items should be given consideration prior to the operation. Similarly, it only takes one team member not using proper movement or stealth techniques to compromise the entire team and the mission. Camouflage defined. An act of deception. It is done to deceive uh, an observer into denying him knowledge of your presence or your intentions. Cover is generally accepted as cover from return of fire. That is to get yourself in a position where bullets fired by an assailant cannot strike you. That is getting behind cover. In a street situation, it would be like getting behind a fire hydrant, behind a motor vehicle, etc. Out in the woods, it would be behind uh, an, an earth bank, a berm, a tree trunk, or a rock, or, or something similar. That is cover. Um, concealment is where you actually conceal your presence from somebody who is searching for you. But camouflage is in a slightly different category. Uh, uh, camouflage can embrace cover and concealment, but at the same time it allows you to be able to view whatever you are looking at. Your position is hidden from the people that you are surveilling in as much that they cannot see you, but you have the ability to see them. Well, on every class that we've run, we have police officers, as I said, correction officers coming on these classes. And a lot of them have a basic idea of what camouflage is. But you do not camouflage yourself if you merely put on a beady uniform like this one here. If you are going to have a camouflage policy, it must be a 100% camouflage policy in that every part of your body, your equipment and your movement is camouflaged from view. The basis of camouflage is deception. And the whole purpose of camouflage is to deceive somebody who may be observing your movements and your presence. And the more that we can do to deny the fugitives that we may be following knowledge of the fact that we are in that area or moving towards him, the safer the officer is going to be. This is an officer survival issue. Officer safety and survival. On our tracking classes on the last two days, we always set up a long follow-up whereby the trainees follow a single fugitive with the aim of practicing all the individual drills that they've learned in the previous four or five days. And as the person that lays the track for the officers to follow, we've noticed certain things. Somebody may be uh, well camouflaged, but there's certain little mistakes that they've overlooked. And every single time there's a mistake because a certain piece of equipment has not been dulled down. There's the flash of a knife blade. There is the flash of the sunlight against binoculars. There's the uh, contrasting colors of a t-shirt against a camouflage uniform back background. So there's the aspect of sun reflecting off bright pink sweaty skin. These are all the things that can give an officer away. And if he is going to work out in the woods against armed and dangerous fugitives, he has to have every advantage that he can possibly retain on his side. And every time he gives away an advantage, he gives it to the fugitive that he's hunting for. So therefore, it's critically essential that for officer safety and officer survival purposes, that he utilizes as much uh, of his ability as he can to conceal himself in the most 100% way that he possibly can. And it's a small mistake, a very tiny small mistake, that can give his presence away and could cause him the loss of his life. We had several cases recently where a certain federal agency worked with us in the desert environment of Idaho. And they had just been issued with a brand new set of webbing equipment, which is in black nylon. They were wearing desert camouflage. And they had this black nylon harness, which made a perfect aiming point in the middle of their chest. So that from a thousand yards away, you could very uh, faintly see their presence. But the element of the black on their chest made a perfect aiming mark for a sniper with a telescopic weapon. Important elements of camouflage. 
and why things are seen. In this section of this program, we will discuss several elements as to why we see things and how the human eye perceives them. To outline first, the list is as follows. Shape Shine Shadow Silhouette Surface Spacing Sound Smell Movement Spore and sensors Let's take these elements one at a time and look at them individually. No one element will provide the desired objective of stealth without the added discipline of the others. Shape Distinguishable shapes must be disguised and made to appear irregular. Our minds have been conditioned by many factors to immediately pick up and identify certain shapes. This is a survival mechanism of the human element. It must be deceived. The first aspect of why things are seen, and this list isn't in any order of priority, is shape. Now, when we talk about shape, we're, we're referring to the shape, the diagnostic shape of the human body. We're so used to watching talking heads on television that the imprint on our consciousness of a head and shoulders is deeply em embedded in us. So that when we look around, we automatically can pick up the shape of head and shoulders. And of course, the head is on top of usually a, a five to six foot body, making it very, very easy to see. The second aspect of shape that we want to have a look at later on is the shape of the weapon that is carried by the officer on this particular situation. So the shape of the head, the shoulders and the weapon are critically important to be abbreviated or modified so that they're not instantly picked up by an observer. Shine Shine may very well be one of the most deadly sins in the breaking of camouflage discipline. There is very little forgiveness in this breach. The human eye will quickly target and perceive shine, especially when out of place. Shine is a very critical element of camouflage. A mistake with shine can be uh, reflected as several miles away. For example, a signal mirror has the ability to shine for over 20 miles. A simple little thing like a pen clip in a pocket here can reflect light and be observed by an observer some distance away and that can give you away very, very easily. So it's critically essential to remove anything on your person or your equipment that has the ability to shine. Shadow. Shadow must be considered when observing what trackers call positive and negative space. The eye is drawn to patterns, shapes, and shine as discussed. By using shadows for concealment, you may avoid detection. Yet, by casting a shadow at the wrong time in the wrong place, you may also be detected. A shadow can work two ways. We can use shadow to our advantage, or shadow can work to our disadvantage. Early in the morning and early in the evening, when the sun is at a low angle, it can magnify our body size by three or four times. So that when, when uh, one is moving at this particular uh, period of time, the shadow can be seen, even if the body cannot be seen, the shadow may be seen by somebody observing, looking for us, thereby giving our position away. Similarly, on the other side of the fence, if we use shadow to conceal our movement and our presence, it also works very much in our favor. Silhouette. Although similar to shadow may not be quickly recognized by the operative as he is cast as a shadow against a dissimilar background. Silhouette is similar to creating one's own fatal funnel. One of the worst giveaways in any form of tactical movement is for officers to move against a light colored background, uh, particularly a skyline. You can see somebody's skyline from several miles away. And on a class we did in Idaho with, with one of the county sheriff's departments there, we could see the tracking team coming from about four miles away, merely by the fact that they walked over the crest of a hill. For example, if you're going to do that, it's better to crawl over the crest rather than to throw a silhouette against the skyline. Similarly, a dark uniform against a light-colored background is a giveaway, and vice versa, a dark-colored uniform against a light-colored background is also a giveaway. So we have to make sure that the silhouette that we are uh, projecting is perfectly neutral and doesn't sh either show up against a light or a dark background. That is what we're aiming for. Surface. Surface may refer to clothing, weapons, or skin. 
The surface of any of these items must be broken for texture and pattern. The surface of any of these items having been worn may cause the element of shine to become a problem. So it's important that when we do have surfaces on our equipment, and I'm talking now about in terms of uniform, that we, we wear a disrupted pattern uniform, or we wear the type of uh, cloth that absorbs the light rather than reflects the light. Any large surface will reflect the light. And you only have to take fighter aircraft now in the US Air Force that are painted in a dull gray non-reflective surface to um, prevent heat-seeking missiles from locking in onto that particular aircraft. It's exactly the same as us in a camouflage and concealment role. We have to get away from broad, single-color surfaces. Spacing. Spacing may apply to patterns on camouflage clothing, not having the appropriate distance between colors or textures, or to a team not being properly spaced, and causing an observer to see the unit conglomeration or an aircraft to pick up on a possible signature. Spacing is an important aspect of camouflage and concealment which is generally overlooked. Basically nothing in nature is regular. Nothing is in straight lines and orderly. Everything is random. So if we have a patrol of police officers moving along with exactly five yards between individuals, this is very easy for the eye to pick up and see. The regularity draws attention to it. It's essential that any tactical formation moving along in a rural end environment or background is irregularly spaced so that the eye is not drawn to that regularity. It's the same in tracking. A regular boot print draws the eye to it. An irregular print is much more difficult to see. And that is a principle that we apply in camouflage and concealment. Sound. As are all of the elements critical in the camouflage discipline of a team and an individual, sound is particularly important. You do not have to be visible to be detected by sound. The observer having heard the sound may now be able to focus sight on you, whereas prior, you were not readily visible. Americans, and I, I say this with the greatest amount of admiration for Americans, are the noisiest people in the world. They're great communicators. They have cell phones. They have um, all types of different communication systems, and they love to use them. It's critical that when you're on an operation out in the woods, that silence reigns supreme. Any aspect of your equipment that rattles or shakes or makes, makes a noise like half empty water bottles, uh, rattling equipment, metal against metal, unnecessary speaking, it's critical that these sounds are reduced to the absolute minimum. Even things like the cracking of a twig can give you away from 30, 40 yards away. So it's essential if you don't want to telegraph our presence to the people that we're searching for, that we try to maintain as much silence as we possibly can. Smell. Professional and skilled hunters are very in tune to smell and the effects that it can have on a successful hunt or the loss of game. However, most law enforcement officers until confronted with the issue at the wrong time are unaware that the smell of aftershaves, oils, deodorants, or cigarette smoke may cost them their mission or their life. In David Scott Donnellan's first book on tactical tracking, he relates a story where smell was used many times in locating terrorist base camps. Not only can the bad guys smell you, but the fleeing of wildlife because of the alarm could be the one advantage your quarry needs to escape or detect your presence. Smell is the next aspect that we come to. Smell is not an observable thing, but smell is something that can give away your presence. For example, uh, cigarette smoke can be smelled from three or four hundred yards away, particularly by somebody who's been out in the woods for a considerable period of time. Their senses become very acute, particularly in the sense of smell. Things like deodorant, um, soap, perfume soap, uh, even soap that you wash your clothing with, rifle oil, sweat, food cooking, uh, anything like this can give the game away. To give an example, in one of my stints in an African army, we were out on patrol one evening, and we could actually smell rifle oil mingled with sweat, which is a very dis a distinctive smell. And we followed downwind on the particular scent and came across a terrorist base camp. So a smell, in fact, is a very good indicator of somebody's presence that can telegraph it well ahead of time. Movement. Movement may just be the most critical element of concealment. 
You may have the perfect camouflage advantage and move at the wrong time, or in the wrong direction, or with the wrong speed, and you're detected. Likewise, be aware when you are the only thing in your surrounding that is stationary. This may also draw attention to a keen eye. If you have ever been out hunting deer out in the woods, they're so well camouflaged, but when they flick the ear, it draws the eye immediately. And although in terms of patrolling out in the woods, out in the forest, we have to move, there are certain ways that we can move which will minimize the ability to see that particular movement. Um, we have to learn to freeze, we have to learn to freeze slowly, we have to learn to move slowly so that the sudden flash of movement does not give our presence away. Spore Spore simply means leaving tracks or sign on the ground or in the area of your operation. When that spore does not belong or your quarry may be sensitive to environmental changes, spore left behind can compromise every effort you have made in your personal camouflage effort. Tracks left by a police team moving through a forested area either on patrol or moving into a surveillance site is critical. There's no point in having all this expensive equipment and ghillie suits and so on and hiding up in a position uh, which is ideal for you to surveil the area that, 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 that you're watching if we're going to give away our presence by leaving an observable track behind us. So it's very critical that when we move into a surveillance position that we do in fact conceal our tracks. Sensors Precautions must be taken to avoid and defeat any possible compromise to the operation. UV brighteners and detergents should be avoided when washing uniforms and BDUs. Light and heat sensors should be studied and the appropriate measures taken not to compromise your efforts or your teams. Even hunters should give consideration, as many animals see farther into the UV spectrum than humans. Clothing that can be washed many times in standard detergents may not camouflage or conceal at all. On the contrary, they may produce shine to the eye and become luminescent to most night vision and thermal equipment. And in terms of sensors, I'm talking about infrared technology, thermal images, night vision equipment and so on. So it's essential that if we wish to conceal our ourselves from observation, we have to take the necessary countermeasures to prevent us being picked up by these different sensors that are currently available. It's ridiculous to spend thousands of dollars on weapons, equipment, uh, surveillance gear, ghillie suits, all that type of thing, if for want of 50 cents worth of camouflage paint we are going to fail in our mission uh, to achieve what we're looking to achieve. So it's the question of the uh, nail in the horseshoe. If we are going to adopt a camouflage policy, that policy must be a 100% policy. In the same way that the uh, knight that rode into battle, and because the nail fell out of the horseshoe, the horseshoe fell off, the horseshoe was lost, the horse was lost, the knight's influence on the battle was lost, the battle was in fact lost. So let's not waste all this equipment and lose it by 50 cents. It's pointless employing a 100% camouflage policy if we do not have the correct mindset. We have to have the ability to visualize the camouflage techniques that we use and visualize ourselves in the environment that we are going to work. Is this camouflage going to work in the environment that we're working in or that we're moving through? We have to continually monitor and visualize to see whether we can actually fit into the environment without giving the game away. And that visualization is an important aspect of camouflage and concealment. An individual's personal knowledge of camouflage and concealment can greatly enhance the team's operational effectiveness. The police or military unit that does not utilize sound camouflage and concealment discipline is either lacking in training or lazy. This section of this project will discuss personal and individual camouflage. Please take this information and use it to build on the previous section. Remember the story of the nail and how one small element can cost a far greater price than you may be willing to pay. Personal or Individual Camouflage First, let's look at the shape of the head.
as well as other personal matters of camouflage and concealment. One of the easiest things to see on a human body is the outline of the head, the neck and the shoulders, simply because it fits on top of the body and for this individual to use his eyes he has to have his head in an upper position. So it's critical that we break up the outline of the head itself. We can add a hat like this one here, black typical sheriff's cap with, with a gold badge on. One, it makes a very good aiming mark for somebody armed with a telescopic weapon, but of course merely by adding the hat does not change the shape of the head. So we must work through and then look at a hat which has what is known as a disrupted pattern material to it. This hat, although the pattern is disrupted and it's much more camouflaged than the black one itself, also emphasizes the shape of the head and adds a brim or a bill to the hat itself. So that is not going to suit our purpose. The boonie hat, however, is halfway towards solving the problem. The boonie hat is a fairly um, irregular shape but it does have this very, very heavy brim. The disadvantages of the brim to the hat is that in wet conditions, the brim tends to fall down and impairs the hearing. Okay. And also, secondly, the brim does tend to throw shadow over the face itself. However, even with the boony type of hat on, it has not yet broken up the, the shape of the head. The way to solve that particular problem is to add camouflage scrim to the hat itself so that it breaks up the outline of the rounded crown of, of the hat itself and the actual brim itself. And in this way it makes it much more difficult to actually see the hat in a wooded environment and where you have bushes and brush in the background. The, the second thing that a law enforcement officer can expect to be seen out in the woods is his weapon. In Africa when I was on operations there we used to ask the African guerrillas what was the first thing that they saw when a soldier came out of the bush? And invariably he would say, the black weapon. And this of course really stands out. One, because the weapon is held in front of the soldier himself or the peace officer himself in such a manner that it is the first thing that comes in, into vision. So it's fairly critical that we change the shape of the weapon to make it look like something else. Remember that camouflage is deception. The important things to change are the barrel itself, because this is the thing that stands out in, in front of the body, the shape of the magazine, which has been spray painted now to blend in with the background of his uniform. It's critical that you do not interfere with the mechanics of the weapon itself. The bolt, the sights and the magazine aperture must be free of any type of camouflage, otherwise Murphy's Law dictates that when you want to change a magazine, there's something in the way to actually prevent that. So ensure that the, the uh, functioning parts of the weapon are not obscured by any type of camouflage. Again, let's review the elements of camouflage as we are discussing for this lesson. They are shape, shine, shadow, silhouette, surface, spacing, sound, smell, movement, spore and sensors. It is important to review the information and elements of camouflage and concealment as they apply to the operational world. We'll go back to David and the OSI team to review these elements in an operational training environment. Keep in mind that the elements actually overlap and must be looked at as a whole. A very important aspect of personal camouflage is the aspect of shine. And great attention to detail must be made to go over all your equipment to either uh, reduce shine or to conceal shiny objects. Some of the things that uh, you would use on operations like a compass, like this. When you finish using the compass and you have to use it from time to time, is put it back in the pouch so the glass doesn't reflect. Other things like spectacles, if you wear spectacles there's not much you can do about that. If you're operationally impaired because you take your spectacles off, it's better to leave your spectacles on and not give them any thought. Aluminum objects like this mug here, if it shines, spray paint it. Take out your spray paint and dull the surface down with spray paint. Knife blades, like this one here, 
obviously is going to shine in the sun and remember that a signal mirror can uh, reflect light for 20 miles. Get yourself a knife that has a non-reflective blade. Also the shiny leather sheath should be covered over with some sort of camouflage light absorbing cloth so that it doesn't reflect the light. Plastic bags on any sort of operational equipment are a total no-no. Throw them away. They reflect light and they have no place in your operational gear. Notebooks with plastic covers should be replaced with non-reflective camouflage covers. Magazines which tend to reflect light quite effectively should be painted over and concealed with non-reflective paint. Anything like sunburn cream, insect repellent and so on should be replaced with this type of thing which you can get from a military surplus store. This will reflect light, this tends to reflect a lot less light, so this is preferable to this type of thing here. Matchbox covers, spray paint them. Re re uh, reduce the reflective ability. Better still, get yourself a cigarette lighter if you smoke or you need fire out on your operations. Get yourself a camouflage cigarette lighter which are available through any one of the surplus stores. To cover shiny equipment, use things like 100 mile an hour tape, spray paint and anything like that which will reduce the glare. Remember a glare, reflected light can give your presence away from a long distance. There are several small aspects of shine in terms of camouflage which should not be overlooked. The first one is the military habit of wearing a wrist compass in the pocket of your BDUs. This or the reflection from this glass here could be your demise so make sure that you take the compass off either wear it on your wrist as a wrist compass or put it in your pocket even better still the other little aspects like this pen clip here in my pocket generally overlooked should be taken care of and the object put securely in the pocket where one it won't fall out and you lose it and secondly the reflection won't give your presence away prior to going off on a rural patrol it's essential that the patrol leader or each individual takes one of his partners and inspects them very carefully, inspects the uniform very carefully to look for camouflage flaws and errors. And you can clearly see on this uh, load-bearing equipment here there's certain areas like the brass studs here on the magazine pouches that shine and reflect the light. The plastic buckles here also have the effect of shining and reflecting light. It's essential that you take care of those before you leave. So we take our ubiquitous camouflage paint and in situ just touch up the brass buttons, the buckles, so that we, we reduce the reflective qualities of the light itself. Making sure that we work from back to rear, examining and checking every single brass button as we turn around. The buckles on the back here also need to be re reduced in their light reflective qualities. It's the attention to detail like this could mean the difference between living and dying out in a woodland operation. Often overlooked aspects of personal camouflage is that of surfaces. Large, black, dark or single coloured surfaces don't take place in nature whatsoever. Anything black in terms of tactical, urban tactical gear have no place in the woods and should be discarded completely. Other synthetics like plastic and nylon have an intrinsic shine to them. If you have to use a water bottle like this, it's essential that you remove the shine once again by spraying it with our ubiquitous camouflage spray paint and reduce the shine on those type of items. Plastic packets, although they have a camouflage pattern, also have a shine to them. Either take them out of the plastic packets and put them in a camouflage cloth packet or take the thing out completely and put it into your pack, a pouch or your pocket. Waterproof material like this synthetic waterproof jacket here once again shines in the sunlight. It shines even worse when it's wet and this should have attention paid to it. Either leave it at home or only take it out when it's absolutely necessary. Synthetic materials used for load bearing and tactical equipment again as I mentioned earlier has a shiny aspect to it like the nylon mesh here, the cordura pouch over here, the black plastic buckles. These surfaces, although camouflage colour in themselves, do tend to reflect light. And once again, we go back to our camouflage dull matte spray paint and we neutralise those areas 
with a spray paint in non-reflective paint. This paint, although right now looks shiny, in fact will dry out and, and produce a matte black or sorry, matte brown finish. Reduce anything that can, re can reflect, like any reflective surfaces must be removed from your uniform completely. And it's essential that one person checks another before you go out on a patrol to make sure that you haven't overlooked even the smallest detail. White skin is a real giveaway in a woodland environment. A story here, when I was working with some police officers in Ohio, we had very, very heavy rains and the mosquitoes were very prolific. And although the officers were completely camouflaged up, I could see them from half a mile away brushing mosquitoes off their face and the pink skin from the palm of their hands looked like little pink flags flying around. So it's essential that we reduce that uh, color value. And what we use, in fact, is camouflage cream or camouflage paint available from surplus stores. Uh, here's a little uh, container with three different colors, or you can get the tube version here, which comes in loam and green. And this is the one that we're going to use this afternoon. When we camouflage a face, we have to isolate the highlighted areas. That is the forehead here, the bridge of the nose, the cheekbones here, the side of the cheek here, the chin, etc., and underneath of the ears. If we reduce that, we can reduce the shape of the head itself. In the high points, put camouflage on the high areas, the cheekbones, not to forget across the eyes. You close your eyes, please. Across the eye itself, on the cheekbone over here, on the chin, under the chin. The neck is also critical. The neck color shows out. The ears, behind the ears, the front of the neck, the back of the neck is also a critical area that has, has to be camouflaged. There's no need to paint the guy up to look like a clown. He's not a clown, he's a police officer on rural operations. And that should be sufficient to break up the outline of the face and the glare provided by the uh, wet, shiny pink skin. Never neglect the hands. Um, either use camouflage cream in the same pattern as the face itself or wear green Nomex gloves which are available from surplus stores. The problem with putting camouflage cream on the hand itself is that the palm, sometimes the cream wipes off. And once again, you've got that flag effect uh, of the pink skin. So probably better to wear the Nomex glove than actually camouflage the back of the hands. You can see the eye immediately focuses to the background where the officer in black is located. Do not fall into the mindset that black is tactical. Black may get you killed when worn in the wrong setting. You must choose the colors and patterns that will aid you in the success of your objective and that will ensure you go home after the shift or after the mission. On a number of occasions recently, I've seen tactical officers going out into the woodland areas in this type of urban tactical gear. And I think that if you compare the appearance of this gentleman here with the second one at the back there, where, he, where we've applied some of the principles of camouflage and concealment, you can see a radical difference between the two. As a tactical officer in a woodland environment, what would you choose? Notice the difference in color shine, surface, movement. There are hundreds of camouflage patterns around the world. Some are commercial patterns used by hunters. Some are designed for military use and have been adopted by police operations around the country. And some are nothing more than material that contains a design that should not be worn for any reason, save possibly a fashion statement. 
David will briefly explain some of the available patterns and their potential use. Well, it's very important to choose a pattern and colors of camouflage that blend into your local background of vegetation and terrain. If you pick a pattern that is too light for your uh, local terrain, it'll stand out against the darker background. And similarly, if you pick a camouflage pattern and type that is uh, too dark for your terrain, then it's going to stand out against the light color background. This garment here is a commercial garment which is reversible and can be used in both spring and in summer and turned inside out can be used in fall conditions when the leaves fall and the background color to the terrain changes. Disregard the reflective zipper here. The ideal thing to do on a garment like that is to replace the zipper with buttons that are neutral and non-reflective. Materials is an important thing as far as camouflage uniforms go. The pattern on the material should, generally speaking, be soft and blended and the cloth should be light absorbing rather than light reflecting. This particular camouflage here is the current Finland military pattern and as you can see it is printed with sharp colors in geometric patterns on what appears to be a shiny cotton type of surface and this is unsuitable for camouflage and concealment because light will reflect off this particular material. Far better to use a softer light absorbing cloth like this commercial pattern over here and this commercial pattern over here that absorbs the light rather than reflects the light. It's also important to remember too that cotton camouflage clothing should always be washed in uh, a type of soap that does not contain nitrates. Any detergent that contains a brightener will create a brightening effect of that particular material and it's essential that the colors for camouflage be muted and blend in together and blend in with the background. A, a garment that has been washed in detergent will shine brightly as exactly the, is what the detergent is intended to do. We have found that the product called Sport Wash works well in maintaining UV protection of uniforms and camouflage clothing. The product is available at most hunting and sporting goods stores. To further enhance UV protection in clothing, you may want to consider a product called UV Killer. This product may be applied to your clothing and your gear. Briefly, while on the topic of choosing particular patterns, it is advantageous to mention the ghillie, or what some refer to as three-dimensional camouflage. In static applications, the ghillie can be quite effective. We have reviewed many suits and various levels of quality. OSI has chosen a suit to recommend based on its ability to camouflage and conceal the wearer. Also, applications such as custom modifications, light reflection, comfort, durability, and the ability to deceive sensors have been considered. Taking into account all of these factors, we will advise you of our pick near the end of this tape. There are two additional types of camouflage, both of them outstanding in the static role as apart from the moving role. And the first one is the three-dimensional type of camouflage which has come onto the market recently. This one creates a wonderful window effect and the eye tends to look through it and beyond it rather than pick it up and identify it as a person wearing that particular uniform. The second one, which is rather hot and heavy and should only be used in static type of operations, is the ghillie suit over here. This ghillie suit and, of course, this particular pattern here can be modified on a seasonal basis by adding the vegetation of that particular area and type of terrain. This pattern here can be spray painted over with uh, uh, matte colored spray paint in greens and browns and so on. So you can actually blend the camouflage uniform into exactly the type of terrain that you're working in. And, of course, the ghillie suit can be modified by adding seasonal vegetation or seasonal color to the suit itself. Both of them outstanding examples of camouflage and concealment, but only to be used in the static and not in the moving role. Well, moving around the country, from the east coast to the west coast, from the northern deciduous forest down to the deserts of southern Utah, we have come to realize that there are th basically three camouflage patterns which seem to fit the bill pretty well. The, the first one for general woodland operations in deciduous forests is the traditional uh, woodland pattern camouflage. This one is a brand new one and the, the actual colors are rather sharp but if you wash this several times and faded the colors out it would be more effective. The second pattern that we found to be very very useful particularly into dry semi-desert arid areas 
is the advantage pattern over here. Some of the federal agencies have in fact gone over to this particular pattern and this one we found the best despite the fact that it has oak leaf pattern on it. In desert conditions this blends in exceptionally well. For a general generic type of uniform we found that the olive drab pattern over here seems to fit most different types of terrain. It blends in with the desert to a good degree and it also works pretty well in deciduous and in pine forests. So these are the three patterns that we generally recommend as being the most useful and most effective in North American uh, woodland tactical operations. But it's important that an officer involved in rural or tactical operations in, in a woodland setting adopts a totally different mindset. The uniform chosen for woodland operations should not be sharp and sexy. This is not a fashion show. Always select a style and a pattern of camouflage that is loose fitting, causing, to, causing you to look like actual part of the scenery. Blend in with the scenery, become part of the scenery. Remember, if your quarry cannot see you, he cannot shoot you, and your life is on the line. So always select a pattern of camouflage, a style of camouflage that fits in and blends with the environment that you're working in. Before moving on, it is interesting to note the advantage pattern of camouflage was developed by professional hunter Bill Jordan. After many hours of research, he has developed a number of commercial patterns used by hunters around the world. Available patterns may be viewed at www.advantagecamo.com. If for no other reason, this site is educational in nature and may be of assistance as you begin to develop your 100% camouflage policy. As we have discussed, both movement and sound are critical elements to your camouflage policy. Both elements can quickly give away you or your team's position. Good movement and sound discipline can make up for a multitude of mistakes. In rural tactical operations, uh, unnecessary sound has the effect of telegraphing your presence in advance to an observer. So it's very critical to cut unnecessary sound down to an absolute minimum. The uh, team must communicate using silent signals. Equipment must be checked before the team moves out on operations. Anything that moves, anything that is noisy, anything that rattles must be taped down to ensure total silence. Anybody with squeaky boots must replace the boots with boots that don't squeak, well-worn in boots. Sling swivels have the tendency to knock. Water bottles sloshing. Uh, one must ensure that radio sets are turned down to the minimum or at least on a secure uh, s exclusive channel. Um, and anything that can make unnecessary noise must be absolutely re reduced. Here's a little test to see if you can recognize several noises. John, John, All of these sounds are normal everyday sounds that become magnified by many times when in the woods. The natural function of the body is to acclimate to the surroundings and quickly become aware of what belongs and what does not. Be very careful not to take your daily habits with you when you begin your rural operation. As the officer moves through a densely wooded area, he moves slowly and fluidly. Choosing the path of least resistance will help you move in such a manner. Be aware of your equipment and clothing as if it were an extension of your being. Learn to feel through your equipment in order to avoid snags and tangles. Movement also applies to that branch that clings loose from your LBE as you make your stealth approach. The keen eye will catch this every time. One note, be aware that choosing the path of least resistance does not mean choosing alleyways and paths that would be likely avenues of approach. These areas will be primed for booby traps and ambush if you're operating in a hostile environment.
when you are moving into a surveillance site or a hide, it's essential that the officer does not leave tracks like these behind that can be seen by even a casual observer. It's very critical that he disguises his intentions here. Several simple tricks you can use. One is to move into your hide area using hard ground. Secondly is to avoid moving over soft ground that will yield a footprint. Thirdly is to move along a line of vegetation like this here, particularly on a track area like, like this. And then if you have to move over sand, soft and yielding ground, wear some sort of foot covering. We at the Tactical Tracking Operations School prefer to use uh, a booty called a stock mock. This is a manufactured article which fits over the shoe and has a furry underside to it so that when you walk over sandy ground it uh, blunts out the track itself and it's very very difficult to see that you've actually walked over the soft sandy ground. When patrolling in a forest environment where you have both light and dark colored backgrounds it's very important not to throw a silhouette. Uh, if you're wearing a dark uniform against a light colored background, uh, which is being known as front lit, you will certainly stand out against a light colored background. If you have a light colored uniform against a dark colored background, similarly this can be seen in, in a silhouette form. The aspect of silhouetting can be greatly reduced by the individual moving or walking in the shadows thrown by the vegetation. And you can clearly see here the individual with a dark colored uniform on has moved back into the shadows and is very much more difficult to see than the in individual in the front wearing the light colored uniform. This is the position where a tactical officer in a woodland in environment should operate. Another technique of reducing the silhouette in a woodland environment is for the officer when he's stationary to adopt a kneeling position. This effectively reduces his silhouette by over 50%, making him a much more difficult target to observe. While on patrol, if officers need to communicate with each other, they should do so by moving forward and lying down, crawling up face to face, so that they can converse in the uh, quietest possible way. This has the double effect of making them effectively disappear and also reducing the amount of sound that can carry. Similarly, this applies to the time when an officer needs to use his radio. If he adopts the lying position and communicates from that position there, he can guarantee that the sound will not travel more than a few yards from the point where he speaks. If while on patrol an officer has to stop and make a temporary observation, it's very important that he doesn't reveal a silhouette by looking over cover. Far better if he can look through the cover or alternatively and even better still look around the cover where it's much more difficult for him to be seen where he blends in with that piece of cover itself. On woodland operations it's often necessary for an officer to move from a sunlit bright area into the shadows of, of the wood line. Uh, it's imperative that he avoids moving into the fatal funnel so that when he enters the wood line he immediately moves to one side and crouches down in the shadows. This has the double effect of moving him out of the fatal funnel and giving him the opportunity for his eyes to acclimate to the reduced level of light. One of the worst mistakes an officer can make is to silhouette himself against the skyline. This is probably the easiest thing for an observer to see and from some distance away. It's essential that he moves in the shadows so that the shadow conceals not only his bodily movement but the movement of, his, of the shadow itself. In open country, particularly in bright sunlight and in early morning and early evening, it's critical that the officer uh, moving along the bank here does not throw a shadow. In this particular instance, the shadow elongates his size by three or four times and this is therefore much easier to be spotted by an observer. The following section will highlight some of the techniques used in team movement. Some do's and don'ts will be discussed. While moving, if you're approached or you see somebody coming who could compromise your mission, come slowly to a halt and freeze. 
signal the problem, and if circumstances allow, move back into the shadows and freeze again. Freezing can cover a whole host of movement errors, even when caught out in the open. Check to see that the position is clear and bring the rest of the patrol forward and continue. Sudden sharp movements will invariably give you away. And in this particular instance, the officer is brushing flies from his face. The pink hand at a distance looks like a flag against the darker background. If you have to move, move slowly and deliberately so that the movement doesn't give you away. If the operation requires it, then it is absolutely essential to move along a track. For example, looking for tracks of a fugitive. Always stay on the edges and be prepared to move off into the shadows if necessary. It's important to walk at a consistent pace and avoid jerky movement stops and starts. This can draw attention and give you away, and in addition, it's very noisy and very tiring. This obviously is a wrong way to move in a woodland environment because as you can see, the sudden movement and breaking from cover draws attention to the individual and gives him away. The correct movement technique in the woodland environment is to flow like water through the trees, always moving from cover to cover and shadow to shadow. This will reduce the chances considerably of being seen. Remember that you do not know where your fugitive is hiding. Any advantage that you give him, you lose for yourself.
When moving over patches of open ground or roads, it's important not to cross over in a predictable pattern such as this, which will give an observer three opportunities to see you. Far better for the team to all cross simultaneously in the shadows or in dead ground, thereby reducing the chance of being seen from three to one. The operational techniques you have seen are designed for use by individuals, hunters, soldiers, or law enforcement personnel operating with the need for mobility and stealth. We have not discussed many of the options available to the operative, agent, or hunter who will have the ability to operate in a static role, such as on a surveillance-type operation. Surveillance is a part of the OSI COBRAs program and is dealt with extensively in the training environment and in a soon-to-be-released video project on surveillance operations for police and military. For surveillance operations, we would highly recommend your review of the ghillie designed by Custom Concealment. These ghillies are very well made and exceed the standards of any homemade or 3D suit we have found. We would strongly suggest you contact the manufacturer for details. Making a ghillie can be a satisfying experience. However, the effort put into making the suit may be better spent on productive training time. These suits are so effective that the State Department has put restrictions on them regarding export. The ghillie suit is the single most effective and innovative accessory used in surveillance, observation or sniping missions today. It's designed to completely blend in and conceal the observer from view and can be modified to fit into all types of terrain and vegetation. It addresses many aspects of camouflaging technique in that it conceals shape, it removes shine, it has no silhouette, it requires no movement to be effective, it has no reflective surfaces and is odor free. However, it is only, repeat, only to be used in a static surveillance or sniping role and never ever to be used on a patrolling mission. It is very hot and heavy to wear and runs the risk of shedding burlap fragments which can be identifiable as coming from a ghillie suit. A well-trained tracker or investigator will pick up on materials left behind by a ghillie suit. Also, ghillies will snag and catch on foliage, making movement uneasy. For these reasons, it is not advisable to wear a ghillie while on patrol or when moving. A member of the OSI Cobra's surveillance team is positioned with no other camouflage or concealment than the ghillie designed by Custom Concealment. Can you find him? In this video lesson, we've covered many aspects of both personal and team camouflage. However, to utilize these aspects correctly, we have to ensure that we adopt a 100% camouflage policy. Remember that every advantage you give to your suspect, you lose for yourself. As a police officer, your aim is to complete your mission and go home safely. After all, there's no second place winner in a manhunt. For more information or to purchase other related items or videos, please see our website at www.osinetwork.com. You will also find an interactive calendar of training events provided by OSI on the website. On behalf of the whole OSI crew, staff, and COBRA's team, thank you. Be safe.